Welcome to a series that focuses on missing 411 cases. All of my information about the cases were collected from the book Missing 411 North America and Beyond by David Paulites. This video is purely informational and you have a link of the book in the description if you want to check it yourself. But before we begin, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you want more videos like this. Enjoy! Kevin Robert O'Keefe Missing October 8, 1985, Wolf Point, Glacier Bay National Park, Alaska Age at disappearance, 36 years Approximately 70 miles northwest of Juneau, Glacier Bay National Park is located in an extremely wild and remote area. The park occupies a region where the Pacific Ocean creates a series of small to large inlets, extending north from the area of Funter Bay State Marine Park. Kevin O'Keefe, born in Sacramento, California, journeyed to Juneau, arriving around September 20. Subsequently, he continued his travel to the Glacier Park headquarters. There, he enrolled in and participated in a class on wilderness living. On September 22, he was transported by floatplane to Muir Inlet, located just north of Wolf Point, where he set up his camp. It's worth noting that he was traveling alone. On October 8, 1985, National Park Ranger David Namath and his partner patrolled the region of Wolf Point by boat. During their patrol, they stopped at Kevin's campsite, where they made a disturbing discovery. Kevin's tent was positioned near the high tide line, and alongside it, they found a line of debris that appeared to be scattered by the high water mark. Notably, the ranger's report emphasized that the tent had one collapsed pole inside. Kevin's sleeping bag, foam pad, and other items were also discovered outside the tent, strewn on the ground. Since Kevin was supposed to be picked up on October 10, the rangers decided to leave his camp undisturbed. After reviewing National Park Service NPS, reports obtained through a Freedom of Information Act request, concerns arose. The following day, a team of four rangers revisited the camp. To their surprise, the camp remained undisturbed, just as it had been the previous day with no signs of overnight use. Despite the concerns, the NPS decided against conducting any searches. Instead, they attempted to contact Kevin by calling him but received no response. On October 10, rangers returned to the area with additional assistance in the form of a Cessna 206 on floats. During a two-hour flight over the region, they intensively searched for Kevin but couldn't locate him. On October 17, 1985, the Anchorage Daily published an article detailing the findings at Kevin's campsite by NPS rangers. They used search dogs and discovered his boots and a hat half a mile away, down in a gully, hidden from the main camp's view. His food and caches were also located, but there was no trace of the 36-year-old tourist. In the same article, Rangers speculated on Kevin's disappearance, stating that it might never be known what happened to him. Early theories of bear attacks were dismissed by the rangers, as they found no bear tracks in the vicinity of Kevin's camp and very little wildlife of any kind. Upon reviewing the NPS report and itemizing Kevin's property, it became evident that items were scattered at varying distances from his tent, at intervals of 60, 120, and 200 to 300 feet, while his boots and knit hat were discovered in a gully. Everything essential for Kevin's survival was present at his camp. He had survival books and pamphlets, film, food, a toothbrush, soap, cigarettes, vitamin E, a compass, a flashlight, and a variety of other items that you would typically expect to find in a campsite where someone intended to stay for over one month. Summary NPS rangers contacted Kevin's family and learned that he had intended to embark on daily short hikes from his camp. His plans did not involve extended overnight treks or meeting other people. An inventory search conducted by the rangers had revealed Kevin's day pack, suggesting that he had not ventured far from his camp. Kevin's glove liner was discovered several hundred yards away from his main camp. His boots and knit cap were located at a distance of nearly half a mile from his camp, and search dogs were instrumental in finding them. At the scene, rangers found no signs of an animal attack, and there was no evidence of blood. Considering that Kevin's boots, day pack, primary pack, sleeping materials, and food were all found at the campsite, it leads to the deduction that Kevin was at his camp when something occurred. 
It becomes clear that there were no animals in the area, as Kevin's food remained undisturbed. The question arises, why would Kevin remove his boots? Did he willingly take them off? It's astonishing how, in a mountainous area relatively close to a populated zone, hundreds of searchers would join the hunt when someone goes missing. However, when you vanish in a remote region, it's as if hardly anyone is looking for the victim. In the case of Kevin O'Keefe, there was no sustained ground search lasting a week. Instead, there were a few flyovers and boats cruising the coast, but a comprehensive ground search never took place. This raises the question of why. It seems evident that Kevin might have ventured further inland from the point where his boots were discovered. So, why didn't the search continue deeper into the woods? If Kevin's boots and glove liner were found at a significant distance from his camp, one would expect an extensive search in that direction. Strangely, the NPS rangers never made this effort, and the reasons behind this decision remain unclear. Paul Michael Lumetra Missing July 4, 2012, 7 p.m., Seward, Alaska Age at disappearance, 66 years As someone who has participated in numerous 10K races over the years, I'm aware that fatalities related to road races sadly happen from time to time. However, it's exceptionally rare for a runner to go missing, and it's nearly unheard of. I must acknowledge that the races I've taken part in have typically been held along major city streets, not in forested or rural areas. The disappearance we're discussing stands out as it transpired during one of the world's oldest races, at a location that had never experienced a fatality or a disappearance before, the Mount Marathon in Seward, Alaska. Seward, a port city situated just 60 miles to the south of Anchorage, primarily rests at sea level. Mount Marathon is aptly described on the Seward Chamber of Commerce website as follows, launched in 1915, the three-mile Mount Marathon is a unique combination of running, hiking, and scrambling up Seward's distinctive 3,022-foot peak. Participation in the race is limited to a set number of runners chosen through a lottery system and competitive activities. The race commences in downtown Seward, ascending the mountain to reach the summit and then descends. While minor injuries are commonplace, major injuries and disappearances are exceptionally rare. The exact length of the course typically ranges from 3.1 to 3.5 miles, depending on the layout for that year. The trail's average slope is 38 degrees, with the steepest slope reaching 60 degrees. The race begins at the corner of 4th Avenue and Adams Street in downtown Seward and concludes at 4th Avenue and Washington. On July 4, 2012, Paul Michael Lumetra had diligently prepared for the race of a lifetime. At the age of 66, Paul was in excellent physical condition for his years and worked as a civilian employee at Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson. In his role as a counselor, he helped individuals leaving the military to organize their resumes effectively. Paul had officially registered for the Mount Marathon race and was assigned bib number 548. At the start line, where the race commenced at 3 p.m., he had family members present to support him. Paul's goal wasn't to win but to accomplish the challenging course with respectability and in good time. To provide some context for the race's speed, Fred Moore, aged 72, completed this year's course in just 1 hour, 11 minutes, and 34 seconds, marking his 43rd consecutive participation in the event. While the race was underway, a couple of unusual incidents occurred. In two separate incidents, runners tumbled on a steep section of the course, resulting in severe injuries. There were limited details available regarding the precise nature of these accidents, but the injuries were categorized as serious. This was an uncommon turn of events for the race, considering the Chamber of Commerce took pride in the event's history of being a safe race. On race day, Paul was dressed in black running shorts and a black running shirt. Due to his poor eyesight, he had opted not to wear glasses during the race. Based on all available accounts reviewed for this segment, it appeared that Paul was the last racer on the mountain. An article on the KTUU.com website dated July 9, 2012, included an explanation from the last person to see Paul. According to the chamber, a race timing crew stationed at the mountain summit began their descent around 5.45 p.m. 
The lead timer, who remained unnamed in the statement, encountered Lemaitre at approximately 6 p.m. when he was nearing the mountaintop. Chamber officials wrote on Monday that Mr. Lemaitre verbally confirmed his intention to continue. He appeared to be in good condition and didn't exhibit any signs of distress or physical or emotional distress, steadily progressing up the mountain at a slow pace. Subsequently, the timer proceeded down the trail. At 6 p.m., a race official spoke with Paul's wife and assured her that he had been seen and was in good condition. They advised her that if he hadn't descended the mountain within 90 minutes, she should contact the authorities, although they believed he was fine. At 8 p.m., Paul's wife reached out to race officials to report that Paul hadn't returned from the run. Race officials promptly got in touch with the Seward Fire Department, which, in turn, contacted the Alaska State Troopers. This initiated the commencement of a search operation. As they endeavored to cover every conceivable area where Paul might have ventured, searchers faced challenging conditions. The visibility was significantly impaired at times due to the mountain being engulfed in fog. Ground searchers also encountered two black bears, which promptly fled from the presence of people. Notably, no grizzly bears were observed during the search. On the night that Paul disappeared, there was a light dusting of snow near the summit of Mount Marathon. Searchers meticulously inspected the area, but could find no tracks Alaska State Troopers' Hello teams arrived on the scene and conducted thorough scans of the mountain with FLIR technology, yet found no traces of Paul. The Alaska Mountain Rescue Group conducted a comprehensive ground search of the mountain but discovered no clues or evidence related to Paul. To comprehend the extent of the search for Paul, the Alaska Dispatch published an article on July 9, 2012, outlining the various contributors to the rescue effort. Hundreds of volunteers have been actively engaged in the rescue operation, including organizations such as the Alaska Mountain Rescue, Nordic Ski Patrol, Alaska Search and Rescue Dogs, Bear Creek Volunteer Fire Department, National Park Service, Seward Police and Fire Department, the Air National Guard, Alaska State Troopers, and numerous Seward residents. Additionally, some racers who had previously competed in the event returned to Seward to lend their assistance to the search. Multiple dog teams from the Alaska Search and Rescue Dogs Unit combed the mountain in an effort to locate Paul's scent. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts, the canine search teams were unable to discover any valuable leads or clues. Summary Paul Michael Lumetra vanished from an area that had been traversed by hundreds of runners. This region featured a well-marked trail and an overlook near the summit, offering clear orientation toward Seward and the finish line. The summit area itself was characterized by minimal foliage and abundant rock, dirt, and boulders, leaving little room for confusion regarding direction. Despite an exceptionally thorough and exhaustive four-and-a-half-day search for Paul, there was no sign of him or any evidence indicating his presence on the mountain. However, it's a confirmed fact that around 5.45 to 6 p.m. on July 4, he was only 200 feet from the summit. Paul even saw the race official walking down the mountain, indicating the correct path to take. He was in close proximity, less than two miles from his family and a place of safety. This case is yet another instance in a long list of missing persons cases where the last person in line mysteriously disappears and remains untraceable. Despite the expectation of a straightforward explanation for what happened to Paul, none exists. Paul had the privilege of having some of the most skilled and experienced searchers globally engaged in the search for him, yet he remained elusive. Cutting-edge FLIR technology was employed from the sky to locate him, but even FLIR couldn't pinpoint Paul's whereabouts. The search effort went beyond the race path and established trails, Venturing to the backside of the mountain in case Paul had become completely disoriented and descended in that direction. Regrettably, searchers found no valuable leads or clues on the backside of Mount Marathon. Paul was officially declared deceased due to exposure, and his family composed an obituary for him, which was published in an Anchorage newspaper. Searchers encountered adverse weather conditions, including fog, which impeded their efforts. Canine units were unable to pick up a scent trail. Paul's poor eyesight was confirmed. He was the last runner on the trail when he disappeared. Even with helicopters and airplanes equipped with FLIR, Paul could not be located. 
It's worth noting that Paul was a substantial figure, standing at 6 feet 2 inches and weighing 215 pounds. On our nation's anniversary in 2012, something out of the ordinary transpired on Mount Marathon. Paul Lumetra became the unfortunate victim of this unusual event. If, regrettably, another disappearance takes place in this area three decades from now, it's noteworthy that the case of someone going missing on Mount Marathon won't be included in any missing persons database because Paul Lumetra has been legally declared deceased. Gerald DeBerry Missing October 10, 2011 at 6.45 p.m. in northeast of Fairbanks, Alaska Age at disappearance, 53 years on October 10, 2011, an exceptionally rare event unfolded when a search team, tasked with finding a missing party, suddenly found itself in the position of having to search for one of their own personnel. This incident occurred along the Steese Highway at mile 70, northeast of Fairbanks. Gerald DeBerry, a seasoned volunteer who had previously participated in various search operations and was intimately familiar with the area, answered the call to search for Melinda Mindy Strats from Utah. He brought his green Yamaha Kodiak four-wheeler and actively joined the collective efforts to locate the missing woman. The event began around 2 a.m. when Mindy became separated from the rest of the four-wheelers in her group. Michael Strats, her brother, promptly contacted authorities to report her as missing. Michael headed to the Long Creek Lodge, where he informed law enforcement about his sister's situation. He explained that she had gone missing on a trail while returning from the wilderness and that her red four-wheeler, trailer, and Jack Russell Terrier were all unaccounted for. Alaska state troopers responded to the report and began assembling personnel for an extensive search effort. By the early hours of October 10, several searchers had already gathered to provide assistance. In the late afternoon, Gerald expressed to his companions that he was starting to feel cold. In response, fellow searchers quickly assembled and kindled a fire to provide warmth. Additionally, someone offered Gerald an extra overcoat to help him stay warm. Once he regained his warmth, Gerald resumed his search for Mindy. While Gerald was actively engaged in the search, another volunteer discovered Mindy in good health near Frozen Foot Creek. Unfortunately, there is limited information available regarding the specifics of Mindy's case beyond what has already been mentioned. As searchers began to regroup and prepare to return home, a realization dawned that Gerald had not returned to his vehicle. Concerned, several members of the initial search teams organized and went out to search for him. It was reported that the last known location of Gerald was approximately four miles from the trailhead where the search had commenced. Searchers were informed that Gerald had undisclosed medical issues, although the specific medical condition was not publicly disclosed. On the morning of October 11, the search effort escalated with the use of two separate helicopters equipped with forward-looking infrared radar, FLIR, to scan the woods, primarily to detect any heat signatures. The Alaska State Troopers dispatched their helicopter along with a Piper Super Cub aircraft. Simultaneously, the Alaska Air National Guard mobilized rescue teams to cover the ground. Formal and informal searches for Gerald continued for a week but there was no evidence of his whereabouts. The lodge where searchers were coordinating their efforts belonged to Paul Potvin, an old friend of DeBerry's. On October 14, the Alaska Dispatch printed a statement from Paul regarding the search for his friend, it's a mystery, said Potvin. The four-wheeler is gone. Something had to have happened to him. He didn't get lost. Everybody agrees with that. He's been out there way too many times to get lost. That's the most baffling part. If Gerald didn't get lost, the question remained, where was his four-wheeler? If the four-wheeler was in the area when the floor was scanning the sky, it should have been detected by a heat signature. However, either it wasn't present, or the floor did not register any heat signature from it. Almost one year after Gerald's disappearance, on Labor Day in 2012, a miner walking near Faith Creek Mine at mile 69 on the Steese Highway stumbled upon Gerald's four-wheeler. The vehicle was positioned on a slight incline, and its engine had been turned off. Subsequently, another extensive search effort was launched in the area surrounding his vehicle, but, unfortunately, nothing was discovered. Summary I obtained maps of the Faith Creek area to determine the location where Gerald's vehicle was found. 
It was situated one small mountain range northwest of Steese Highway, with a road leading from the highway to the mine. Adjacent to the north side of the small mountain, there's a small valley running parallel to the highway. It's challenging to comprehend how Gerald, who was well acquainted with the area, couldn't make his way back to the search headquarters, even if his vehicle had failed. He would have known it was only a short walk of three quarters of a mile back to the roadway. Going further north was not an option because there was a larger mountain range in that direction. I find it quite unusual that aircraft equipped with FLIR technology never managed to locate Gerald's vehicle. The Alaska State Troopers are experienced experts in search and rescue, conducting such operations routinely. It's perplexing that, within a relatively confined area, they couldn't spot a vehicle using FLIR. In a final effort to discover any clues on the night of Gerald's disappearance, the Alaska Air National Guard dispatched a second aircraft equipped with FLIR technology. They thoroughly scanned the area but were unable to find anything. Gerald's sisters traveled to Alaska to offer their assistance in managing their brother's affairs. Cheryl Hart, one of Gerald's sisters, conveyed the following statement to WTAP on October 20th. We just have to maintain our faith and hope, you know, that he either wanders in or we find him. Regrettably, Gerald DeBerry has never been located. Thanks you guys for watching. Leave a like and subscribe if you found these cases interesting as there will be more 411 cases in the future. Until next time, stay safe.